Do you ever notice in yourself a tendency to make things more complicated than they really are? Do you ever catch yourself doing that even with God and with issues of Christian belief? In this series, we're getting back to the simple, core, foundational principles that lie at the heart of the Christian gospel. We want to take some time to just get back to the basics. My name is Bob. I'm the lead pastor here uh, within Coram Deo. You may not know me. I haven't preached here since June 5th. And so if you're newer, you might be wondering who I am. Um, That little break has been good for me and I think good for our church. Here's why. Uh, Number one, it allows me to focus my leadership in some other areas of our church that need development and vision. And secondly, it gives us a chance to develop and empower other leaders. And so as you've noticed, if you've been here over the summer, um, we've had a lot of different men preaching the word. And I don't know about you, but I want to express my gratitude and my appreciation for those men. Yeah. Pastor Justin, Pastor Dusty, Trent Sensky, Mike Kresnick, Kevin Huddleston, Nick Clatterbuck, and Neil Kwiatkowski. Those seven guys preached uh, nine sermons over the course of the summer, and I was really blessed by their ministry to us over the summer as we studied the book of Psalms together. And I I want you guys to know I'm grateful for the ways that you have served our church. Uh, We're now turning the corner out of the summer and into the fall. I know it feels early. It's only the second week of August, but for some of you, school has already started. For others of you, it starts this week and In a few weeks, the fall will be in full swing. And so at this time of year, when kids go back to school, we together want to go back to school in the basics of Christian theology. Uh, You saw the video, the series is called Back to Basics. And man, if you're new, what a great time to join us. Uh, We are just going to dive into some of the most foundational concepts and truths and principles at the core of Christian theology and at the core of the message of the gospel. And so whether you are newer to the Christian faith or you're not yet a Christian and just trying to investigate, understand what the message of Christianity is, this is a great time for you to be among us. Uh, As I've been praying through and getting ready for this series, the phrase, the idea that sort of captivated my mind and my prayers is this statement of the Apostle Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians where he says to the Corinthian church, I'm afraid that you may be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. The simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. See, devotion to the Lord Jesus Christ is actually quite simple. I'm concerned that like we do with many things, we can complicate it and convolute it and complexify it so that we're lost in layers and layers of abstraction. And so we want to get back to just the simple purity of devotion to Christ. What are the foundational truths of the gospel? What are some of the foundational theological concepts that we need to grasp in order to to get our minds around the core and the heart of Christian theology? And so we're going to start... As you've seen this morning with the topic of God, which I hope hope you would agree, if we're going to go back to the basics, that's a pretty basic thing to start with. Uh, Who is God? And what does it mean to know God or to encounter God or to discover who God is and what God is like? And so I want to start with this provocative statement from A.W. Tozer, one of my favorite authors, uh, a pastor from a couple of generations Ago, listen to what he writes. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. He goes on to say, Our real idea of God may lie buried under the rubbish of conventional religious notions and may require an intelligent and vigorous search. 
before it is finally unearthed and exposed for what it is. Only after an ordeal of painful self-probing are we likely to discover what we actually believe about God. Here's what I think is provocative about Tozer's observation. He says, our real idea of God might lie buried under the rubbish of conventional religious notions. We may have all kinds of language and concepts about God that are nothing more than conventional religious notions, and yet our real idea of God, our real sense of when we think of God, when we think of what it means to worship God, what do we think of? That may lie buried underneath all of that language and all of that formality. And so he suggests that we need to work to dig down to what is our idea of God? How did we develop it? How do we come to our understanding of who God is? And is it accurate? Is it true? Is it real? J.I. Packer puts his finger on the problem in a different way. Listen, he says this. Without realizing it, we have during the past century bartered the biblical gospel for a substitute product which, though it looks similar enough in points of detail, is as a whole a decidedly different thing. Hence our troubles. For the new gospel conspicuously fails to produce deep reverence, deep repentance, deep humility, a spirit of worship, a concern for the church. Why? Because it fails to make men God-centered in their thoughts and God-fearing in their hearts. Notice the important observation that Packer is making. He says the real gospel, the biblical gospel, ought to make us God-centered in our thoughts and God-fearing in our hearts. And so if what we have embraced as the gospel doesn't cause us to be God-centered in how we think and God-fearing in our hearts and our affections, then it's something other than the gospel. I think you'd be hard-pressed to look at the church in America and to conclude that Packer is wrong. As a whole, we are not God-centered in our thoughts and God-fearing in our hearts. And so I want to bring us back this morning to the very simple first words of the Bible. In the beginning, God. I think there is a ton of truth packed into those four words, and it's not an accident that the Bible begins with those four words. In the beginning, God. Notice it does not say that in the beginning God appeared, or that in the beginning God began, or that in the beginning God came into being It just says, in the beginning, God. Here's the most fundamental question of philosophy. Why is there something rather than nothing? If there is no God, where did being come from? There's an old Latin phrase that goes all the way back to the beginning of philosophy that says this, ex nihilo nihil fit. That means from nothing, nothing comes. Nothing can come from nothing. If at the beginning of the universe there was nothing, then there would still be nothing. So how did we get from nothing to something? If you want to disprove the existence of God, you have to answer that question. How can something come from nothing? How can being arise from non-being? How can existence come into existence? The simple answer is, it can't. And listen, you don't need an electron microscope or a philosophy degree to figure that out. You just need basic logic. If you're an atheist or an agnostic, this is the great problem that your worldview cannot solve. 
And, and many of my skeptical friends sort of simplistically, when pressed with the question, how could being arise from non-being, how can existence come from non-existence, they, they sort of say, well, I mean, evolution. Friends, you realize, right, that the theory of evolution is designed to explain changes in the order of being, not to explain being itself. It does not tell us where did being come from? Where did existence come from? Why is there something instead of nothing? If there always was nothing, why is there now something? This is such a massive question and such a pressing question, even for the scientific community, that Stephen Jay Gould, one of the most prominent evolutionary biologists in recent memory, proposed in a scholarly journal article the hypothesis of panspermia, which is that the seeds of life in the first place were planted on earth from outer space somehow. Maybe through a comet, maybe through a meteor, maybe through intelligence, but somehow they came from outer space. That doesn't take any faith to believe. Christians are the only people that have faith, right? How refreshing to turn from speculation to the biblical record, to biblical reality, to the proclamation of the Bible that in the beginning, God, God is the uncaused cause, God is the unmoved mover, God is the being behind all being. Why is there something rather than nothing? Because God, that's why. Where did existence come from? It came from God. Why do you exist? Why do I exist? Because first of all, God exists. And God, you see, is therefore the primary being in the universe, the only uncreated being in existence. And so Tozer, as he goes on, rightly says, the mightiest thought the mind can entertain is the thought of God. And the weightiest word in any language is its word for God. All the problems of heaven and earth are nothing compared with the overwhelming problem of God. That He is, what He is like, and what we as moral beings must do about Him. Notice that Tozer identifies the most foundational truth about God as the reality that He is. Which calls to mind God's self-revelation to Moses in Exodus chapter 3 when when asked His name, God says, I am that I am. It calls to mind Jesus' words in John chapter 8 where He says, before Abraham was, I am. God consistently describes and defines Himself as the being who is self-existent, who has always been and will always be. And that's why the Bible begins with the words, in the beginning, God. Friends, God is And you see, the first movement of all worship is to acknowledge God as God. The first step of all true worship is to acknowledge God as God. God says in Isaiah chapter 45, there is no other God besides me. A righteous God and a Savior, there is none besides me. Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is no other. The Psalms tell us, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The worshiper, by contrast, acknowledges God as God. The first step, the first movement in all worship is to acknowledge God as God. In fact, The writer and philosopher Dallas Willard describes a Christian as a person who happily lets God be God, which I think is a pretty great definition. 
How many of your problems in life come from not letting God be God? I mean, think about it. How much of your anxiety comes because you won't let God be God? Rather than trusting in God's sovereign control of the world, you fret and worry about things that you lack control of. How much of your doubt comes because you won't let God be God? Because you trust your ability to figure it out more than you trust the reality and the truth of what God has revealed. How much of your defensiveness comes because you won't let God be God? You have to defend yourself and justify yourself rather than trusting God to vindicate you. Our lives would be much better, wouldn't they, if we just happily let God be God? And the first movement of all worship is to acknowledge God as God, or to say it another way, to say the same thing another way. The first movement of all worship is to acknowledge the creator-creature distinction. Here's a way of framing that out visually. You'll notice in this diagram, in this picture, in this little visual, there are two spheres of reality. There's creator, there's creation. The lines are intended to reflect communication. God reveals and communicates himself to his creation. And as the created world and as created beings, we have the capacity to communicate with God. But creator and creation are entirely separate levels of being. God can never become the world because he is its creator. And the created world can never become God because it is always created. The first movement of all worship is to acknowledge this distinction. If you want a picture of sort of Christian thought and Christian worship in a diagram, here it is. In fact, the the now deceased philosophy and theology professor Cornelius Van Til said, this is a picture of what Christian belief looks like. Acknowledging the creator-creature distinction is a foundational piece of Christian worship and is unique to Christianity. See, there's only one other option. If we deny the creator-creature distinction, here's what we're left with. One type of being. One type of reality. The created order is all that is. And then what we do is we turn creation into God. We take things in the created world and we give them the place that only God can occupy, which is exactly what the Apostle Paul is talking about in Romans chapter 1 when describing what human sin looks like, he says, they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. What sin looks like and what sin causes us to do is to trade creator for creation. To worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. And and listen, make no mistake. You can do that under the name of Christianity. Remember, let's go back to Tozer's observation where we started. Where he said, our real idea of God may lie buried under the rubbish of conventional religious notions. It's possible to profess and use the language and the lexicon of Christianity while not acknowledging God as God. Is your Christianity a pile of conventional religious notions or is it a vital encounter with the living God? Is what you understand yourself to gain or to get or to be brought into by faith in Jesus Christ some benefit, some tangible good, or is it fellowship with God himself? Listen to Jonathan Edwards. The redeemed 
have all their objective good in God. God himself is the great good which they are brought to the possession and enjoyment of by redemption. God is the inheritance of the saints. He is the portion of their souls. God is their wealth and treasure, their food, their life, their dwelling place, their ornament and diadem, their everlasting honor and glory. They have none in heaven but God. He is the great good which the redeemed are received to at death and which they are to rise to at the end of the world. The Lord God, He is the light of the heavenly Jerusalem and the river of the water of life that runs and the tree of life that grows in the midst of the paradise of God. The glorious excellencies and beauty of God will be what forever entertain the minds of the saints and the love of God will be their everlasting feast. Now, lest you think that Edwards is flowery and abstract in his language and he's missing the possibility of enjoying other things, listen to what he says next. The redeemed will indeed enjoy other things. They will enjoy the angels and will enjoy one another. But that which they shall enjoy in the angels or each other or in anything else will be what will be seen of God in them. Friends, that's what the gospel invites us into. The enjoyment of God. The treasuring of God. Communion with God. Fellowship with God. You are made to enjoy God and to delight in God and to have communion with God. That is your soul's deepest longing. And it's yours if you want it. All who want to enjoy fellowship with God are invited into it through faith in Jesus Christ. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So, What comes into your mind when you think about God? What is your idea of God? How big, how eternal, how majestic, how vast is your sense of God? How captivated are you by the depth and the substance and the reality of who God is. To ask the question a different way, how often in your prayers and in your devotion and in your worship do you repent for having a small view of God? See, most of us know that Jesus came to die for our lust or for our pride or for our bad temper. We easily reckon Jesus' death as applying to our observable behavioral sins. Most of us who are Christians can connect the dots between my bad temper and Jesus' death for that. But do you see just as clearly that Jesus came to die to forgive your lack of reverence, your lack of awe in who God is? Jesus came to die for your flippancy toward the divine glory. Jesus came to die not just for your sins of commission, but for your sins of omission, including the omission of a deep reverence for God. And so trusting this morning in the grace and the mercy and the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ, can we humble ourselves 
And can we repent for our lack of awe? Can we repent for the ways we reduce God to a being much less glorious than he really is? Can we acknowledge that we who speak the name of God on our lips and sing the name of God in our worship all too often are marked by a small and shallow and superficial vision of who God is? Can we go back to the basics of getting on our knees before God Most High and just saying, God, we, we don't have a real sense of who you are. We have neglected and minimized and shrunken your glory, and for that we need forgiveness. For that we need renewal. For that, we need fresh grace to restore our eyes and our minds to a right vision of who you are. Friends, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. What comes into our minds when we think about God is what will drive us to worship, to repentance, to change, to transformation, to evangelism, to mission, to discipleship, to obedience. It matters what we think about God. And so before we go on in this series to investigate some of the basic doctrines, some of the basic truths, some of the basic promises and proclamations of the gospel message, can we start? with coming back to a right picture of who God is. I want to ask that you now would take a moment with me in quiet reflection. I want to ask you to seek God in your own soul and acknowledge where your thinking about God is shallow or non-existent. Acknowledge, thanks to the grace of God in Jesus Christ, the ways in which you have minimized God to something less than he is. Take about 30 seconds in silent reflection, then I'm going to lead us in prayer together. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, we acknowledge that we are guilty of what Romans 1 speaks of. We are guilty of serving the creature rather than the creator. We are guilty of minimizing your beauty and your majesty and your glory. We're guilty of thinking small thoughts of you and having a small vision of you and small awe and worship for who you are. And we thank you that you sent the Lord Jesus Christ not just to die for our observable sins, our behavioral sins, the ones we know that we commit, but you sent the Lord Jesus to die for our minimizing of you, 
for our blindness to your glory, for the smallness of our affection toward you. So thank you that we can be honest about those things this morning, knowing that Christ has died to set us free, and knowing that your desire is to pour out your spirit to give us a fresh vision and a fresh sense of your glory and your majesty. And so that's what we ask for this morning. We ask that you would give us a fresh sense of who you are, that you would awaken our consciousness to the majesty and glory of the fact that in the beginning, God, that you were before all things and that in you all things hold together and that in you we live and move and have our being and that in you is our greatest good and our greatest joy. So God, restore to us a fresh sense, a fresh taste, a fresh sight of the majesty, the glory, the beauty, the wonder of who you are. Open our eyes and our minds to behold you, especially as you have revealed yourself in the life, death, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray these things for our good and for your glory. Amen.